As Democratic candidates prepare to take the debate stage in Las Vegas tonight, a new poll from ABC News and The Washington Post show Senator Sanders surging ahead of the pack. And while he may hold a double-digit lead over his opponents, he is distancing himself from one of his most prominent surrogates over a key issue in the race, Medicare for All. According to a new Washington Post article, Senator Sanders is rejecting Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's suggestion that compromising on health care would be acceptable. Senator Sanders argues his Medicare for All plan is already a compromise. Sean Sullivan penned that article. He is a CBSN political contributor and national politics reporter for The Washington Post. He joins me now. Welcome, Sean. So what exactly did Congresswoman Ocasio-Cortez say to make Senator Sanders distance himself from her on this issue? Well, she was talking about health care and specifically Medicare for All in an interview with the Huffington Post that got published last week and actually got a lot of attention from Sanders supporters. And the point that she was making was, look, if we are not able to pass a Medicare for All system, which, of course, is one of the signature issues that Senator Sanders is running on, uh, she suggested the idea of, you know, maybe having a public option, an optional public insurance program. And the way she presented it was, look, even if we had to compromise and we ended up with that, uh, would that necessarily be the end of the world? Where to a lot of Sanders supporters, uh, it would be the end of the world. They didn't like that. I talked to one uh, close friend of Senator Sanders last week uh, who didn't like her comments, who felt, you know, that she shouldn't have said what she said. And last night was the first time we actually heard from Senator Sanders himself. He was asked about this during a CNN town hall, and he took a different perspective. He said, look, my plan is already uh, a compromise, the plan that I've put forward. Why is this a significant thing? Well, Congresswoman Ocasio of Cortez is arguably Senator Sanders' most prominent surrogate. She endorsed him last fall. It made huge waves in the race. She's been campaigning for him. Uh, you don't tend to see candidates and their top surrogates disagree like this and disagree publicly. So it's something to watch, especially as we head into tonight's debate. And she is certainly a popular surrogate. We know that. Um, so you also report on Senator Sanders' base and how results in the early races show that his movement while very strong, seems to have its limits. Where do you see cracks in the Sanders campaign's ability to garner support outside of his base? Well, when you look at the first two states that have already voted, Iowa and New Hampshire, you see a pretty consistent pattern. And what you see is that he's winning a little bit more than 25 percent of the vote. He's winning with a coalition of young people. He's winning with a coalition of liberal voters. And he's winning uh, with a coalition uh, of some voters in, in rural areas. But the question for him is, can he expand beyond that base? If this field does shrink and you start to see these more moderate candidates drop out and coalesce uh, around whichever moderate candidate is left in the race, what happens to the vote then? And then another issue that some analysts have brought up is uh, the suburban vote, which could be key in a lot of these upcoming states. What will happen there? There's no doubt he has built a loyal and strong base, and it's a base that I think a lot of other candidates in the race right now wish they had mm -hmm. because he won in New Hampshire. Uh, he effectively was, you know, kind of neck and neck with Pete Buttigieg in Iowa. So it is a strong base. It's stronger than, uh, you know, other candidates in the race right now. But the question is when, if and when this field does shrink, what happens? Is he able to expand? And one of the challenges he faces is that some critics say, look, this is not a movement that they feel like they're welcome in because they see a lot of Sanders supporters saying, hey, it's my way or the highway. Now, if you talk to Sanders supporters, they say, look, we are a welcoming movement. We are a multi-generational, multi-racial movement. So we'll see if he's able to expand uh, here in Nevada. That'll be a big test because it's a more diverse state mm -hmm. than we've seen in Iowa and New Hampshire. And we'll see if he's able to expand in South Carolina. Well, to that point, Sean, about some potential new supporters maybe not feeling welcome, what more can you tell us about reports that there is a a subset of Sanders sort of core supporters who are perceived as perhaps overly aggressive and might be turning off some of this potential potential new support that Sanders could garner has he himself addressed some of the behavior by supporters at all he has addressed this, and this is becoming increasingly a bigger issue in the campaign. You're seeing Joe Biden bringing up. You're seeing it. Uh, you're seeing Mike Bloomberg's campaign bring this up as well. And here in Nevada, it became a flashpoint in recent days because the Culinary Union, which is a really powerful player uh, in Democratic politics here, said that they received a lot of aggressive criticism 
uh, and vicious attacks from Sanders supporters after they criticized his health care plan. Sanders was asked about this last night in the town hall, and he said, look, I don't condone uh, bullying. I don't condone any of this uh, online personal attacks. Uh, but he also distanced himself from it in a way and suggested that some of the attacks potentially are not even coming from actual genuine supporters of him, Ooh. that they might be coming from people trying to stoke discord in the race. Uh, he mentioned the possibility of, of bots who potentially might be doing this online. So you heard a, a couple of different responses from him. And for his critics, a lot of them, what they've said is, look, what we'd rather hear you say is, I don't condone this and I don't want any of my supporters doing this rather than sort of distancing himself from it, raising questions about who is actually doing this. So we're seeing uh, a little bit of a back and forth right now between not only the campaigns and Sanders, but uh, again, the culinary union, which is, uh, you know, a, a integral part of, of politics in Nevada. Absolutely. And Sean, um, his 2020 rival, Michael Bloomberg, came out with an ad depicting extreme language on social media from Sanders supporters. So is he addressing that in particular? Well, I think he's addressing the sort of broader concerns, which not only the Bloomberg campaign is bringing up, uh, but it's something to keep an eye on in tonight's debate, because, of course, this is going to be the first time that we're going to see Mike Bloomberg, Bernie Sanders together being able to debate, obviously other candidates as well. Uh, and they have had no shortage of disagreements so far. Each side seems eager to attack the other one, to use the other one as a foil. Mm -hmm. So we'll see how this all plays out. Now, how much of Senator Sanders' base now is a part of what he built in 2016? There's no doubt it's a big part of it uh, in a couple of ways. One, he built a very big and powerful email list in 2016, which has helped him raise money online from supporters in this campaign. Uh, and he actually got a lot of exposure to people when he ran, and that can count for a lot in politics. So his name identification is higher as well. People know who he is. He doesn't have to introduce himself in some of these states the way that a Pete Buttigieg or an Amy Klobuchar does. And he did have a very, very loyal base of support in 2016. The challenge for him going into 2020 was, in 2016, it was largely a two-person race. It was Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton, and that was it. And for a lot of voters, it was a binary choice, and they chose between the two. This time around, you saw a lot more candidates, a lot of different choices. And so some of his support has no doubt fractured and moved on to other places. But at the end of the day right now, again, I think a lot of candidates would be happy to have his right. level of support. Uh, what we saw in Iowa, what we saw in New Hampshire. And here in Nevada, he is one of the early favorites uh, to, to win the caucuses potentially on Saturday. He does have strong support among Latino voters, particularly younger Latino voters. That's something that his campaign says it's worked hard at. So he's, he's well positioned here in Nevada. Um, you know, despite some of the challenges he faces, again, a lot of candidates would probably love to be in the position that he's in right, right. now. Right. His support is solid, no doubt. And as you pointed out, he's got a lot of Latino support there in Nevada. We hear, though, that his campaign worked hard for that. They really, uh, you know, focused on it. Have you seen any of the other campaigns trying to take a play, you know, a page out of his playbook uh, and, and try to replicate some of that? Well, I, I talked to, uh, a couple of months ago to Latino activists and uh, Latino leaders about kind of who was you know, doing the most outreach. And across the board, it did sound from them that Senator Sanders was doing the mm -hmm. most and that they had concerns about some of uh, the other candidates. They are and they have been trying to make up ground and trying to reach out to Latino voters. But one of the issues that Latino activists I talked to mentioned was, you know, this campaign spent so much time heavily focused on Iowa, heavily focused on New Hampshire. These are predominantly white states where you don't have a large Latino population. And they felt that given how much time and energy the candidates were spending focusing on those states took away from their potential to sit down with groups to hear more about their issues, to hear more about what's important in Latino communities. So there is a lot of catch up being played here by a lot of these candidates. All right. And we can say, see that all play out in Nevada soon. All right, Sean Sullivan, thank you so much. Thanks.